Hi and welcome to Polly Originals with Fiona Abel Smith. Today I thought we'd have a, another go at painting with polymer clay. This time do a sweet little um, pendant or brooch, whichever you want to make it like this. Um, and I've called this one the Lone Tree, because there is, as it looks, just a single lone tree. You can either do it in bright jazzy colours, and this is the sample that I will do for you today and take you step by step through. Or you can go more muted, this one's a, on the blue and um, purpley side, or even just stick to a simple colour. This one was done with all greens. So there's lots of different ways you can do it, but I will take you through the techniques I've done to do the Skinner blend for the background, how to create the, the moss and the foliage on the tree here, and this little stone effect in there as well. So the, these are the tools we're going to need for today's project. As per normal you need a pasta machine and some wet wipes and tissues just to keep your hands and all your tools clean as we go along. We'll be using a tissue blade, a craft knife, a clay roller, cocktail stick, we we'll always need cocktail sticks, then a selection of sizes of needles depending on what size channel you want to put in the back of your piece if you're planning on making a pendant. So these are the two I've suggested, that's a two millimeter knitting needle and this is the clay beading needle um, that you buy with some of the clay um, roller, bead roller sets you can get. Just a larger knitting needle, blunt ended one, this is what I use as per normal for smoothing out any gaps. Then we want a piece of baking parchment to work on doesn't have to be this thick, any, any a piece will do, but it's just good to have a, a loose piece that you can move things around with as you're working on it. A piece of um, greaseproof or waxed paper, we're going to use that to smooth down, and a smoothing implement. These are one of these stones um, that you can buy on the internet. Um, a roller, it works just as well to go around, but I happen to have one of these, so I'll use one of these. And then some texture sheets. So there's a couple of, a lot of people have got this sort of foamy type stuff. This is also the underlay from Ikea. Both of these will work well in what we're doing today. We also need some um, liquid polymer clay or PVA glue, whichever you've got to hand. This is the FEMA one. I've just decanted it into a little pot just to help me out. All brands work well for what we're doing and obviously use a brand depending on what clay you are using. A cotton wool bud and I've just chopped the ends of the cotton wool there just to give me a long tube. A little bit of mica powder if you want to. This is optional, you don't have to do this. In the technique, in what I've shown you, um, I've actually used gold, but you can use whichever colour you want to do. And I've chosen today to use the Melanie Muir Geo template um, cutouts for the design we're going to do. You can see that there. There we go, so I'm going to use this big one. And this is number 37. You can, of course, use whatever shape you've got and use whatever template you've got. These ones are quite good where you've got the aperture that you can cut through. And today I've used Melanie Muir's Organic Texture Stamp, texture stamps, and this one is sure, gives you a nice finish. And if you are using a texture stamp, something like this, then you'll need a little bit of corn flour or corn starch. I just keep mine in a little Tupperware box like that. And then I just add it on with a brush. So that's all the stuff you need for today's session, so let's get going. I'm using Fimo Soft today because I find it quite a good one to do when you're doing these painting type techniques with clay because it's a nice soft clay but to be honest any of the brands of clay will work really well for this technique so just use whatever you happen to have. I've gone for black, white, this is the chocolate brown, the lemon yellow, tangerine, this is the Indian red, plum and Pacific blue. But it's just choose whatever suitable colours are in the clay um, that you are using. And the amounts, these two pieces, the black and the white, these are half ounces or 14 grams of clay and these are quarter ounces or 7 grams of clay. So first thing you need to do is condition all your clay. So here's the clay ready conditioned. If anyone doesn't know how to condition clay, there are loads of good videos out there showing you how to do it. And I do have a video myself showing you how to quickly condition polymer clay and I'll put a link in the details below this video. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do that background um, blend of colours and this is going to be a Skinner blend. Now 
this is going to be a slightly more complex Skinner blend than some of the ones I've done before because we're going to be using all of those colours. So it's a six way colour blend. So I will take you through in detail how we are going to do this Skinner blend. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to take little bits of our colours. So this is the amount we've got from our quarter ounce pack and it's been um, nicely conditioned and put through the pasta machine. And I'm probably going to tear about half of it off because we don't need an awful lot for what we're going to do with this Skinner blend. But we are going to use the same Skinner blend for a couple of the different bits of so we're going to start with the blue, then we're going to put purple next to it, then some of the red, then some of the orange, go on to the yellow, and then just about the same amount of the white. And we're going to make a blend through in that direction and that will give us this blend in the background of the piece here. Now it might seem more sensible to put the darker colour, the purple, at the top. However, this particular blue and red, when they mix together, don't make a particularly pleasant shade of purple as far as I'm concerned, which is why I've put this purple in between the blue and the red, because then we'll get a nice graduation from the blue through into the purple, into the red, and then the rest of these colours will blend nicely down. And because we're doing a Skinner blend, those of you who've done Skinner blends know before, we need to have a diagonal mix of the colours and it's normally done by doing two triangles um, put them together so they're slanted and triangle on either end and then you do the mix. However, we're going to do this very simply. We're going to take our blue and almost roll it into a ball to start with and then by pressing it sharply down on the tile, both ends we're going to create ourselves a triangle. I'm going to do the same with the white because that's the piece at the other end. The same thing into a ball, pressing down just the corners, pulling up the edge so we have a triangle on that side too. And you notice I've put them so that both the diagonals are going in the same direction. And then these colours we're just going to make into little lozenges that will sit alongside. So roll into a ball, roll into a flat end of sausage, put it alongside and just repeat for the orange and the yellow. And then the white will go on the end and that will be our blend. So you can see there we've still got the basic, basic concept of a Skinner blend where we've got the diagonals going all the way through. So we'll end up with all white on this side and then go a little bit into yellow, a bit into the orange, into the red and all the way through. And what we're going to do now is take a roller and give this a bit of a roll just to make it slightly thinner so it will go through the pasta machine. And then I'll take you over to the pasta machine and we'll put that through. One thing I am going to do when we go put it through past machine is I'm then going to add a layer of white over part of this. So I've got my um, white clay here already conditioned. So I'm going to put this back through the past machine on setting number three before I start putting this through as a Skinner blend um, to give myself a layer of white clay. And I'll show you what I'm going to do when we get to the next stage. But I will already have done this bit, so I thought I'd mention it now. So here's my sheet of white clay that's gone through on setting number three on the pasta machine that I will layer up with this Skinner blend in a moment or two. So here's my blend of clays and I'm about to put them through the pasta machine. I've turned the pasta machine up to setting number two um, because this is quite a thick layer of clay. And I'm putting it through and I'm going to push it right up nice and tight towards this, towards this end because we only need quite a thin um, blend when we're doing this Skinner blend. Now some of you might have either packs or clay or magnets or other blocks that you can put into your pasta machine that will actually block up part of the pasta machine so you can only have a very small piece that's working at any one time and they are fantastic for doing this technique. However, if you don't, you can still do it just by manipulating the clay and pushing it along and that is what I tend to do because I actually want this to go even smaller or even less wide than it is here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put, put this through the pasta machine and as it comes through, I'm going to collect it in my hand here. And then I'm just folding bottom to top. And that's the way to do the Skinner blend. You always, if you collect it in your hand, always fold bottom to top, bottom to top. Then you know you will get a good um, 
blend when it comes through. The other thing to do is, this is um, a tip from Sarah Shriver, which I've told you before, but for anyone who hasn't seen it, we also just turn it that way around. And the reason we alternate it each time we go through is because you would think that the rollers of your pasta machine are completely symmetrical, but they tend to do either that or that. So if you don't flip it each time, you'll end up with a piece of clay that's that sort of shape. Whereas re really what we're looking for is a nice um, oblong shape. So I'm going to put it through a couple more times just to start getting my blend coming through. Don't worry about any mess on the bottom like that. That's not going to show up in our finished piece. And now I've got a fair bit working. Remember I said about the sheet of white I'd got? Well I know I only want probably about that much in width of this so I'm going to cut that much off and then back the whole of that with some of the white clay because this is going to be too bright a mix I want a much duller mix and in Fimo you need a fair amount of white to make this um, a lighter mix if you're using one of the other clays then you can use a much thinner setting of white probably down to a sort of a seven or eight being a thin setting on your pasta machine on my machine one is a thick setting and nine is a thin setting so I'm just going to take that off and put a sheet of this behind it. Okay, so there, we, there we've got our blend and I've backed it with that sheet of white and now I'm going to start putting it back through the pasta machine and carry on making our Skinner blend. Keep this bit, we're going to need this for something a bit later on. Okay, so I'm going to put it through just once, first time just to get it nicely back to that setting number two. And then I'm going to start putting it back and I will speed this bit up as we go um, because you don't need to see me doing this but I, it'll be quite a few passes through the pasta machine before we get the blend done but you will also notice that I will try and make it thinner so I will effectively be pushing it together like this throughout its length top and bottom usually in the pasta machine to make myself a, a smaller width of blend because I only want it to be about that wide really so that's about an inch and a half about five about four centimeters in width so I'll speed up the video and we'll see how we go when you've got yourself a nice blend we're going to put that back through the pass machine on setting number three back through that may to make it longer and thinner And we're now ready to start putting that into our finished piece. So there's our blend, nicely finished. Obviously you can do yours for more times if you want to make it even smoother, but I quite like that nice graduation I've got there. And from this point on, I'm going to start working on the piece of um, baking parchment I mentioned earlier. And now we're going to take our template, or whichever template you've got, and I'm just going to lay it on a nice pristine piece of the blend and I want to have a little bit of the light showing here. So I'm going to be chopping this off about here. So I need to make sure I've got, if necessary, less blue and more light. And when I'm happy with my placement, I'm just going to take a cocktail stick and run it down the inside. You can obviously cut this in place, but I just find it easier for what I'm doing at the moment just to do that, because now I can take my tissue blade and just using the straight of the blade just chop down following those lines I've made with the cocktail stick. Okay so what we need to do now, oh, I'm going to do this background this little bit that's just peeping behind the finished piece there and we're going to do this by creating another Skinner blend and setting it in to the um, background here. But the first thing we're going to do is just create ourselves a nice little wavy line of background hills. And I'm going to take this piece off, but I'm going to keep it. Do not get rid of this piece, it'll come in handy in just a minute. So now I'm going to put this to one side whilst we do a blend for the hills. Now if we go back to this piece, this cut-off piece we had earlier, um, that I said don't discard, if we take just a little bit of it. I'm going to chop off most of the blue. I'm going to chop off all of the blue because I don't want the blue in the blend. So with this piece we're just going to chop 
fold that in half and we're going to put it back through the pasta machine on setting number two again just keep going until we get a nice blend um, it's going to blend with this one as we did earlier so I'll just get that bit done okay there we go it's a blend it's not particularly smooth all the way through but we don't need it to be for what I'm about to do it's quite nice to have some um, striations going through it I'm then going to chop this in two lay one part on top of the other and I'm going to put this back through the pasta machine on subject number two that way in to give myself a longer thin piece there we go and now I'm going to put it back through the pasta machine now for me I'm putting it through straight away on my thinnest setting which is nine on my machine um, but you can if you know your machine would tear that up putting it straight through at number nine just work your way down to your thinnest setting on the pasta machine okay so we have a nice long thin piece here and now I'm just going to concertina this I'm going to make it quite a small concertina so it's probably about a quarter of an inch about one centimetre um, in thickness and just keep folding it back on itself trying to make sure you don't trap any air in the folds don't worry about it being too neat again this is we're going to be using this for um, rolling hills in the background so it doesn't need to be too neat okay and then I'm just going to press that flatter and then push it down so it's roughly oblong blend about something about like that because that's all the height we're looking for but we wanted that um, blend where we had the light on the bottom through to the dark towards the top so I'm now going to chop that in two put the two halves together chop it in two again put the two halves together and effectively what we're creating is a slice that we can then use and put in as our hills so I'm just going to take off a small piece of that doesn't matter if it's not too neat because we're about to roll this and put it through the pasta machine I'm then going to roll it just a fraction longer and then because of it we're doing this as a background same as with our previous piece we did we're going to put this through on setting number three on the pasta machine and I'm putting it that way through to make it longer that way there we go we can now go back to our landscape piece and putting it so that the the light bit is towards the bottom if you pick up the piece you had earlier and lay it on top that will give you the right template fittings so we can just slot that in where it fits down there now we do want this one to go slightly longer than this so as you can see I've extended this beyond the end of piece there I might move it just a fraction up and then you can because we know it's going to go in that direction just use your tissue blade to work down those two lines there and then with your craft knife just cut around following the lines you cut earlier and then when you pull this piece away you're left with that which hopefully when you pick it, pick, pick it up so just fit in and that'll be our hills with a little bit of mist showing in the bottom as we go further down our piece now for the bottom, we don't very see very much of this bottom piece at all, so we're just going to use some straight brown just to fit in at the bottom. So we're going to do the same again as we did here, just cut off a piece here, sort of wibbly wobbly shape, keep that piece to one side, get your brown clay. And because we're working on setting number three on our pasta machine, I'm going to put this through on setting number three as well. And then if I just chop myself off a piece, put this in the middle, and as we did before, just use that as a guide to cut off so that hopefully when we pick this piece up, it will just slot in. We should now be able to go back to our template that we were working with and again just with the cocktail stick give yourself a bit of a measure and I'm going to go I'm actually going to go a little bit wide here um, because I know I'm going to tidy this up later on so it doesn't matter and I'm not going to see that I'll do the same with that piece and chop off the end 
Now you want to make sure that all those joins are nice and smooth. So take your piece of baking parchment or grease proof paper and your um, smoothing implement. Say so one of these stones is really good or an actual pebble is very good or your roller. With a roller you could do that sort of movement. But seeing as I've got one of these, I'm just going to rub it gently over the background. make sure that all those seams are nicely joined and it's now one continuous piece. So the next thing we need to do is to make our little stone. And for the stone in this piece I used black clay with some of the blue and some of the brown. So we'll do the same again. So I'm actually just going to take a bit of the blue that came from the top of the blend, so it's got a tiny bit of the uh, red in it. Just pull yourself off a bit of the brown and a bit of the black, because we don't need a lot for what we're doing here. I've always liked the fact that when you're mixing scrap clay pieces together, you sometimes get the most amazing sort of swirls and effects all over the clay. And I'm really going to take advantage of that here by taking these small bits of clay and just tearing them into pieces. that ragged rake gives you a nice sort of feeling or effect and then put them together and tear again. You can put them together so they're like that. Have a bit of a squidge round. When you're happy put them through a setting on the pass machine. Mine's on three at the moment so I'm going to keep it at number three and see what you've got. If there's nothing there you're happy with tear it into a piece again and just keep going, doing that, keep putting it through until you suddenly find a piece that you think looks quite stone-like and I'll carry on doing that until I find a piece and then bring you back. Okay so there's a piece here that I'm quite liking so I think I'll use that piece and I'm just going to Take off a little round of it with my knife because we don't need very much at all here. And then I'm going to take a little bit of this excess because I'm going to give it a little bit of a shape. So roll that into a ball, press that down on your tile and decide which way up your piece is going to be. I think that's going to be the top and press that down. Bottom of your stone really needs to be quite flat, so I'm just going to press that in flat. And then you can have a bit of fun with this. I'm just going to bring it up. Wherever you've got a dark line or a strata, you can take your, the blunt end of your craft knife and sort of push in to create lines and gouges. You can, with a blunt end knitting needle or a cocktail stick, press down and create holes. All sorts of nice little nooks and crannies that your stone will have. When you're happy with what you've done, and these, these holes wouldn't be so round to make it nice and jagged, we give it a bit of texture to the whole piece. So I'm just going to dab over the whole piece, giving it some texture, seeing how it looks. quite a nice sort of rugged effect we've got there. So decide which way up you want to do actually. I think that might be the bottom. I'm going to change that so I'm going to make that the bottom so it stands up and out. So when you're happy just take your piece and place it somewhere on your work and then you can best spend a bit of time doing more stratas, more lines in your piece a bit more texture if you want, careful not to texture into the sky at the same time. And when you're happy with that, we'll start to create the foliage down the bottom. Keep the bit that you used for the rocks and put that to one side because we might want to make some more rocks and we'll also use that for something else later on. Now to make the foliage is quite fun. Um, it's a good technique this. Um, you're going to need not very much of your clay. So we'll take some brown, some black, bit of the blue again. 
some orange, some red, and you can also take some of the bits um, from the blend that you did. So you've got a nice sort of rusticy type mix. Now I haven't put a lot of white in here at the moment, but it would be quite nice to have a little bit of a lighter colour as well. So we're going to take a little bit of the the whitey yellow. So you, as per normal, whenever we're doing things, we've got some darks, some lights, and some mid colours. When I was a young girl, I used to visit my grandmother, and she was great one for getting fresh herbs from the garden and cutting the herbs up into loads of small pieces. So effectively, this is what we're going to do here. Except unlike when I was a girl, and we did chopping motion where you held onto the handle of the knife and moved the blade round. Of course, this is a tissue blade, so we can move both sides. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to chop this into a myriad of small pieces. It takes a few minutes, so I might well speed up the video. Okay, so I am literally going to start chopping. So I'm just changing the angle of my blade on the direction, just going backwards and forwards. Scooping it up, putting it back on itself. Getting lots of lovely small pieces. Okay, I think we're done. So as you can see, just lots and lots of um, very small pieces. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take small lumps of these chopped up clay and attach it to our piece. Um, we're going to sort of start from here and have it sort of coming slightly up into the back here, coming up over the rock and effectively covering up most of this. You don't have to cover it all up because um, the brown shows through or just show some of the background earth. Um, and take your time. So don't rush too much. This is one of those that Slower is better. When you've added a fair few bits on, you might decide you want to put another rock on. In which case, just take another small bit of clay, roll it up into a ball, make it roughly rock shape, add some texture, and that can sit down in front as well. Let's put him down there. And we'll add a few more bits around him. You're not going to see in very much detail of these because, of course, we're all sort of slightly silhouetted here by the sunset in the background but it's just enough to add a bit of interest in the front and now for the fun butt now we're going to start adding that tree when you've finished adding your rocks you should find you've got quite a bit of the the rock color left so rather than mixing just plain brown or plain black it's nice to have a bit of um, color differentiation in your bark so i'm just going to take this and roll this up Those bits we're going to come back to in a minute, so don't get rid of those or push them up. Keep them as they are. And that's going to take a small bit at a time. And it may not look as though there's much in the way of um, differentiation there, but there's enough that it makes a difference. And what I'm doing is I'm just rolling this out and pulling it out as I go. And the theory with trees is that they get wider, obviously, towards their bottom and every extra branch that you add to a tree will add that amount onto the trunk so for instance if I put that piece on there then I'd need to add an extra piece in there as it went down towards the trunk so you can do this in various various ways I'm, 
I'm afraid I'm going to turn this towards me when I do this so I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, I will turn it back each time I put a piece on so you can see. You could, if you wanted to, just draw yourself um, a line of where you want the um, branches to go. But personally, I find it harder to actually follow a pre-drawn line um, than just let, it do the, let them do their own thing. So what I tend to do is I will just start it somewhere about two-thirds of the way up. And then if you twist this as you go, it will move the piece of clay down in such a way as to give you a really sort of weird and twisted shape. And that is what we're looking for. When it gets to the bottom, just chop it off so it's sitting on top of your piece. And then repeat that for a couple more times. You don't need more than about three branches for this because we are just looking for a silhouetted shape. So I'll carry on with that one that I did a, a couple of minutes ago. So we'll have him coming off perhaps up here. Remember what I said about the uh, the trunk bit, so I'm keeping, I've added that one in all the way down to there. We're going to make this wider in a minute, so don't worry about that just at the moment. And then I'll just probably do a couple of tiny pieces. Let's have one going off here. And don't worry if yours don't go too much to a point. Um, we're about to cover this over with foliage, so it's not going to make that much difference. Let's have a little one coming up here. I'm just going to change that slide. Can you see here where it's created very much um, a right angle? The branches would tend to go back come off at an angle more like that. You see that looks more natural. So let's see, another last little bit. Actually I might just do a piece up here, taking him out. I'm very bad, I have a tendency to overdo these. This is one of those cases where less probably is more. Let me have a look. I think, I think that'll do. I think I'm happy with that. So, other things we need to do to the branches. I mentioned that we're going to make this longer, or this, this thicker rather at the bottom, and we do that, very simple. If it's not um, wide enough, we can add small clay in, but if it is wide enough, with your something like a blunt-ended knitting needle, just squash it flatter. So I'm squashing it and pulling it outwards at the same time. And you can do that for any bits where they join on. Just making sure any of the joins look. You can always move this slightly to make it slightly more crooked. The more crooked these trees are, the better they look. That's, well, that's my opinion. Okay, there we go. I'll just gently press that down, make sure it's all nicely pressed down. If you do happen to get a tiny little bit like that on your um, piece, just take a wet wipe and pull it off and that works for any sort of smudges you get you should normally be able to pull those off with a wet wipe as well at this stage okay so we're nearly there for this part so what we're going to do now is we're going to put some foliage on the top of the tree and we're going to take just a small amount of the mix we had earlier and we're just going to change the flavor of it so we're going to add a lot more white and a lot more orange and some more of the yellow, can you see here? So we had some of the yellow in as well, so I'm going to take those two and then a bit of the actual yellow. And then exactly the same as we did earlier, we're going to chop this into smithereens um, to make it nice and fine. So I'll do that, and so I'll probably speed up as per normal whilst I'm doing it, and then I'll come back and talk to you when I've finished.
Okay, so I think that's just about ready. So same thing, we'll push that to one side. And just as before, we're going to add bits with a cocktail stick, trying to keep it nice and random shapes. Now when you're doing um, the foliage for the trees, it tends to be sort of like, think like cotton wool buds um, or cotton wool clouds on the end of your branches goes along the bottom it's usually relatively flat along the bottom and then balloons out into like a, a cloudy type shape over the top and sometimes it's nice to have it going across branches as well I've done that in some of these so you can see here I've added some bits further down here so it's gone across so we'll just add and see how we go as per normal there's no right or wrong with this it's just however whatever looks good on your piece so when you've got it on try to spread it out a little bit It'd be nice if you could see a little bit of the um, background colour shining through because you do see sky through bits of foliage. This is just giving us like an abstract idea of some foliage on top of our tree. course with the cocktail stick you're sort of spreading it out but also pressing it in to make sure that it adheres and sticks you don't want these bits falling off once the um, piece is baked And if you've got a piece of your tree you really don't like, where the branches haven't gone right, then just add some of this on top. It can cover a host of uh, problem areas. I'm just going to turn that around to me, see what it looks like. I think it needs just a little something out this side, so I'm just going to add a tiny, another little branch out here. And that's the other thing, don't, don't ever worry about um, whether or not you can change things at any time. The answer is yes, of course you can. So let's put it actually, turn him around, let's have him coming out. There we go. I'll just give it, add an extra something just down here, just to balance up the design. One of the problems doing it upside down, so it doesn't always give me a good idea. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, so I know it's very messy around the edges at the moment, but I am happy with that. So the last thing we need to do for our background is to create our little flowers just to give you a bit of um, added interest at the foreground and also to really make the um, rock stand out more. So to make the flowers I'm going to use what we've already got. I'm taking a tiny piece of that blend we had for the background and I am going to put this through on the pasta machine that way down, put it through on setting number three and chop him into tiny pieces because we just need a very very tiny little piece here we need tiny pieces put those through back on setting number three put it back through that way on a very thin setting so setting number nine on my machine and then I'm going to roll it up from this end create a tiny tiny wee little Skinner blend and then I am going to take a little piece of my orange Put that through on setting, probably a thin medium setting, it's probably number four or five on my machine. That was on four, so I'm happy with that. So we'll just cover our piece in that. Now 
and then that will give us our little flower cane. Now I know the ends aren't going to look at all good, but that's fine and we're just going to reduce this down by pressing it in with our fingers and we only need a very very thin cane for this. So I'm going to chop it down in the middle. I'm going to take one tiny piece and make him really really small. So you can see how thin that is there compared to my finger. And then if we take our piece, I'll chop off the end of that and discard it. So I've chopped off just a piece because it's easier to keep it rolled that way. And what you should be able to do is you should be able to take off a piece on the end of your craft knife and straight away press it onto your work. Now we're creating little flower heads here. Remember I've got a second stone down here. These will always appear towards the top of your foliage, sometimes rising above. They won't be over the um, top of the... They won't go past the back of the top of that stone, but they will go over the front of this second stone that we've put in here. And just add as many or as few as you like. Remember to overlap them at times, because in nature they would be overlapped. And when you are happy that you've got enough pieces on, just take your cocktail stick and press a little hole into the middle of each one. Adds an extra dimension by giving it a darker centre and also of course make sure it's nicely adhered to everything in the background. And then last but not least, with your cocktail stick, if you want to, just go up and around your trunk of your tree to give it a little bit of texture and a few lines. So you're just drawing up lines up the tree in the direction the branches are going. Okay, so when you're happy with that, it's time to chop off the sides neatly. And because this is a square design, we can simply just follow the lines we were already working to and just neaten them off. Don't worry too much at this stage about keeping it exactly as it was unless you're planning on doing it to match with something else in a design. Okay, so there we go. So now we want to add it to our background and we're going to do that by getting our black clay and putting it through on setting number two of the pasta machine till we get a piece that's big enough to go completely over the back of our piece we've just made. So I've taken a tile that I'm going to cook my piece on and I have got my black clay set setting number two and I'm going to make sure this is nicely pushed down onto the back, give it a roll, make sure there's no air bubbles trapped in there. And then I can take my texture sheet, this has been nicely um, doused in corn flour or corn starch. These texture sheets are fantastic because what I love about them is that when you press down you can immediately see that you've pressed all the way down as that goes darker. I'm just pressing in all the way down, make sure I've got a nice pattern and I can pull that off and reveal the pattern I've got. And I'm going to take some gold mica powder, Gilda's paste would work just as well for this um, but we'll just take the mica powder for now and I'm just going to smear it just on the top 
it just gives you a nice sort of little shimmer around the border of your piece. And I find the mica powder is, is it's, it's subtle, it's, it's there and it gives you that nice finish but it's not too strong. Clean your hands and then the theory is you should be able to peel this nice and easily off your baking sheet without distorting your shape. Find a nice way to put it down on your background piece so that the colours will surround and try and put it down in such a way so you get you know, air bubbles underneath this part. Now I'm pressing down mainly on the foliage there so keeping my fingerprints away from the background. That looks fine. Now do you remember the cotton bud we had earlier where we took the ends off? I'm going to use this up against the sides of my piece so that I can measure and have exactly the same border that I cut off all the way around. that it all looks okay and then one final thing you can do if you wish with the lid of the mica powder you will sometimes find there's little tiny bits of mica on there so just on the end of your cocktail stick so there's not too much you can just take tiny tiny bits of the mica powder and just add a slight bit of shimmer up parts of your tree trunk doesn't need much. It just adds a little something. That is ready to bake and just bake as per the manufacturer's instru instructions for the brand of clay you are using. So we'll come back when that is baked and I'll show you how to put the back on. Here's our piece finished and baked. So to make this into a pendant, we're going to put a piece of backing clay on the back and then we're going to use either a beading needle or a two millimeter needle or even a four millimeter needle. Whatever size you want or you know your channel needs to be, depending on how you're going to bead it. I'm only going to need beading thread, so I'm going to do the thin beading needle today. Take your leftover bits of black polymer clay um, these can be the bits which got the mica powder in it as well, that's fine. Just mix them back up um, through the pasta machine and put it through on setting number three. So here's our clay. Now if you go back to using your piece of baking parchment, at the moment simply pop your piece over the top and use your tissue blade to cut down to give you a guide as to size. Keep a little bit of one of these pieces that you've cut off spare and we want a piece that's going to be wide enough to go over whichever um, size implement you decide to make for your beading channel. So because I'm doing this one I don't need very much at all so probably about an inch, two and a half centimetres and then just chop off a strip like that. So I'll put that on one side for now. But do it whilst you remember, otherwise it's very easy to scrunch all these pieces up and then you have to put it back through the pasta machine again. So now we can just lift this piece off 
and we're going to put the tiniest little bit of um, liquid clay on this not enough to make it slip or slide um, just enough to make it tacky and that will just help when we're pushing this piece in to hold it in place so I've just taken a little bit on the end of my finger there dab it on around the place so you can see just how small amount it is that I'm putting on there so I'm just spreading it around as I say just enough to make it tacky nothing else and now we can pop him back down onto our piece should now because it's on this be able to peel off quite easily your backing piece and spend a bit of time making sure that this is pressed down we don't want any air bubbles between these two layers so I start on the middle and work my way out and I'm holding it very gently on this side and really on these raised bits try not to get any dirty finger marks on that bit so just work your way out from the middle towards the outside And then we should be able to make sure there's absolutely no air bubbles in there whatsoever. Now we're going to put our beading needle and I know because this bit is horizontal that where I want to put my channel for my necklace will also need to be horizontal so I can just move the needle up to quite a high place because we want it to hang nicely around the neck and then you can just sit your piece of clay over the top and then with the blunt ended knitting needle just roll the excess of the clay either side just to neaten it down and make sure it's joined nicely in with the background. Now at this point you want to give whatever you have put inside a really good twist to make sure it really is going to move backwards and forwards and we'll need to do it backwards and forwards because what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it just so it's slightly proud so that when we take the texturing sheet and put some texture on this piece because this helps to really hide where that join was with the extra bit of clay we've put on. I haven't removed it, it's still in here. But we can texture all the way around and again all the time I'm very aware where my fingers are on the underneath of the piece making sure I'm not going to get any messy marks anywhere and then when you put all the texture on if you twist you can still pull your piece through, pull it out the other side and again I'm going to push it through so it's just gone inside there but the hole is still there and then you can press down again to give you your texture and by the time you press back through give it a twist however we just need to neaten off those ends because what will have happened as you can see is that as you pressed it down so your clay will have gone round and further out over the edge but because it's a flat piece all we need to do now is take your tissue blade and I tend to do it at an angle so let me show you here so I'll do it at an angle going away from the outside so I'm beveling it inwards and because we've already baked that underneath level so can you see that it's just sort of gone it at an angle it just gives you a nice feel and it also makes the, the front piece look quite thin and quite delicate even though you have got quite a good bit of weight and thickness of clay across the whole thing so Because this is a very thin needle I don't need to do anything more than that and I can just um, bake it flat on the tile and then remove the needle. If I was using a larger needle then I would probably put a little bit of um, foil underneath both sides just to hold it up slightly to make sure I didn't push down too much on the beading channel that we've created. And then the last thing you can do if you want to, we've got a nice texture on the back, completely up to you, but if you wanted to make it match with the outside edge we've got here then you can as we did before just take a little bit of mica powder on your finger and just spread it all over to highlight some of the texture So he is now ready to bake. So here again are the finished pieces for um, the tutorial today. So this is one obviously I've just done 
and when I did this one I actually did the larger hole there so you can see it's actually got a two millimeter hole all the way through so I can put some um, beading thread through that or a nice piece of leather thong something like that. This one has, is textured, same as I've just done in the video, but I didn't put any mica powder on this one because I hadn't put any mica around the side. And that's just done in the blues and purples. Um, so emerald green, say blue, purple, lilac are the main colours in that one. And then this one, I haven't finished at all because I haven't decided whether I'm going to do a brooch or a fridge magnet, so it's still completely blank on the back as yet. And this one I used emerald green, apple green, some lemon yellow and white and I made myself some sage green by adding some extra blue and brown and a little touch of red into the emerald green. So those are just a couple of options for you. Obviously there are loads of different ways you can do this and I've done this tutorial mainly just as a chance to show you how to do the tree and also to show you how to use little leftover bits of Skinner Blends to create the illusion of mountains or valleys behind your piece. So I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, if you did, as usual, if you wouldn't mind just pressing like and if you haven't already, subscribing to my channel, that would be fantastic, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.